So I have to pick my computer. Oh, you yeah, if you don't mind, then we can put that one in. I'm sorry to do that. I just need to have to Wow, that's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hook me up there? Uh, what does this have for connections? HDMI. Is this the present or the laptop's going to be used all presentation long? Not all of them, just mine. I think we have to go back to content. What does that mean for? Oh, that is that all that has? Is, no, is that? Is it more? the same one you sent me? Uh, I, I mean, I can use that because I have I have it on that one. It does have a it, it does have a VGA connection now. Okay, there we go. Is it different than the one that you sent me though? It's different enough. I'd rather use it, but if, if not, I can use it. We can look this up if you want. Yeah, that's fine. I only ask because the one that's going to be on live stream is the one you sent me. That's why I might make it easier because when it goes live stream, it's, it's actually a uh, library. Uh, it's not a problem. Does he need that here? Yeah, because he, I mean, he's done with that one. He wants to stay with that. I thought he said you're going to use, no, I thought we're going to stay with what you have. Right. Constantine, so you want to stay with what 
they have uh, that's sent. Does he have, is that on his computer? No, you, did, did you have it on here? No, this is... You had a picture. Yeah, right, it was on this computer. <clears throat> okay, well, if we want to go back to this computer. Okay. That's fine. And he can hook that up. I'll wait right there. <coughs> okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, we'd like to get started um, with uh, Grand Rounds today. It's a special uh, lectureship that uh, we've uh, has been developed, uh, the Paul Ebert Lectureship. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gus Marutis, who uh, all of you know, but has in, been instrumental in uh, developing this lectureship, as well as he's going to introduce a very special uh, person today who's going to uh, deliver a, a talk on the training in the congenital heart surgery and the nuances of that and how that's changed in our new era. Um, Gus has been here now six years. I've known Gus for Gus over 20 years. Maybe more. Maybe more. Hey, I, yeah, maybe, not that, not quite that many more. But uh, he came uh, and six years, ago, be, he's been here five years. Six years would be in January and, and um, he developed our pediatric uh, heart surgery program. Uh, in a very collegial manner with all of us. It's uh, been a, a, a great experience as well as a sharing of information, sharing of cases, as well as helping each other in the operating room, which has been a, a, not only a, a very uh, wonderful thing academically as well as for the patient, but has also been an excellent collegial uh, working relationship. Uh, during that time, though, <clears throat> and I, I don't want to belabor this because I could go the whole entire hour and, and discuss what some of the, the things that Gus has done and his many accolades, but uh, <clears throat> he's done uh, over 400 cases. He's completed and in, in the process of completing another textbook on congenital heart surgery, numerous manuscripts, uh, which he also uh, reviews uh, manuscripts for the journal thoracic cardiovascular surgery and anal thoracic surgery. So he's always a busy person, and if you don't have his attention and you're talking to him, he typically has his head down where he's re reviewing a manuscript or, or working on his next project. So. Uh, he's become uh, not only a valued colleague from an institutional standpoint, an intellectual standpoint, but as uh, I think all of us can attest to, uh, a very good and close friend. So with that, Gus, I'd like to, you to introduce the Paul Ebert uh, Lectureship, as well as a very special guest that we have today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, t I'd like to review the uh, goings-on of uh, the the Paul Ebert, thanks, man. The Paul Ebert Lecture Series. It was inaugurated in 2014, as you can see. Uh, Jim Kirkland, son of John Kirkland, uh, an all-American diver, came and gave the first uh, talk on athletics and surgery. Where's the uh, the the, uh, the the clicker that go on? Is it okay? Uh, thanks. And um, it was followed by Jim Tweddle. Luca Vercella, and, and now our fourth uh, lecturer. This is a snapshot of Paul Liebert, a great uh, cardiac surgeon, great person. He unfortunately died early. Uh, this is a, a eulogy that was published in the American uh, uh, College of Surgeons. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, uh, journal. He was born in Columbus, Ohio, 1932, it seems an e eons ago. He was an All-American in baseball and basketball in the same year at, at The Ohio State University. Uh, first team basketball, all 10 big selection, MVP, first uh, 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 Ohio State U uh, University player to score 500 points in a season, 21 and 8 record as a pitcher, still has a uh, uh, we may not still have it, but he did have the strikeout record at the time. He spent two summers after graduation in uh, semi-pro baseball. Here he is uh, 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 playing basketball with this huge wingspan. Uh, I operated with him for two years, and uh, it's, uh, it was a really great uh, opportunity. I had to stand on, uh, on uh, stands uh, just to get in line with him. Uh, he received offers to sign him with the New York uh, Giants, uh, New York Baseball Giants, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. But because of the way the rules were, he couldn't go to medical school and play baseball, professional baseball. So wisely, he chose to go to medical school at uh, 
the Ohio State University. He received his MD degree, took his internship at uh, Johns Hopkins University under then the great Alfred Blaylock of the blaylock kausig shunt as you all know. Uh, professor of surgery at Duke when uh, Sabiston moved from Hopkins to Duke, he brought him along. His first uh, appointment after, sir, after his residency was associate professor. In two years, he was full professor. He, was, uh, he had residents at, uh, when he was the chairman of the Department of Surgery at Cornell. He had more, many of the residents were older than him. He was a child prodigy of some proportion. Um, he, was a, he was a chairman of the Department of Surgery at University of California, San Francisco, where I met him and became und under his influence, which was enormous. President of many organizations, considered one of the uh, outstanding pediatric heart surgeons in the world at that time, and has left a legacy of, of great, uh, great rec record. Uh, he, uh, just a couple of his contributions included cardioplegia, uh, neonatal and infant open heart surgery, improved surgery for, uh, for uh, or proof survival for patients with truncus arteriosus, and neonatal uh, uh, arterial switch operation. In retrospect, I'm thinking now, I was present, I was an intern present when the first cardioplegia <laughs> was given in a, in a human being. Uh, first time, this was in 1973 or, so, yes, 1973. He received, Paul Lee re received the Theodore Roosevelt Award. That's the highest uh, honor that the NCAA can bestow upon its own. Namely, uh, people are candidates if they've done a great job in their careers and as sports uh, enthusiasts in college, and then went on to do great things in the world. He shares that, that uh, um, distinction with Dwight Eisenhower, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, John Glenn, Sally Ride, and Omer Bradley, who, as you know, was one of the five star generals uh, during World War II. He had three grandchildren, uh, five grandchildren, three children, before his uh, sudden and untimely death in 2009. Here's a picture of him in his residence. He was always very comfortable around us. Uh, when, you, when he uh, got comfortable, he was always able to talk about his time at uh, at Duke and also at Hopkins with uh, the great uh, Blaylock. So the idea in this lecture was really to pick people who had a sound mind and a sound body, exemplifying the um, tenets uh, and the ways that Paul Liebert lived. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it, when he was doing a little baby, it was almost like he was crouching down, he was ready to do a set shot, you know. And that's how he looked at life. It was, a, it was a, uh, an athletic event. Uh, of course, uh, it wasn't a game involved. It was a person's life, and he took that very seriously. Uh, the Roman poet, uh, Juvenal, uh, extolled the virtues of a sound mind and sound body. Of course, earlier than that, had to be a Greek, wouldn't it? Thales uh, talked about what, what a man is happy. Uh, he who has a healthy body, a resourceful mind, and a docile nature. I was amused by the docile nature bringing that here to cardiac surgeons, uh, which is anything but uh, docile nature. But that's the way life is, I suppose. So let me take you on a little bit of a cruise here through some of our colleagues here. This is uh, Fred Mansfield at Emory when he was a rower. Uh, by the way, the criteria for these uh, next uh, was that somebody had to do something while in college, right? Uh, we all did things in high school, but I we chose it differently. And this is uh, Gene uh, Freed, who went to Rockford College in Illinois playing soccer. You can see him about ready to kick the ball. Uh, who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Uh, you know it, it's because it's right here, right? So it's, this is GP3, otherwise affectionately known as GP3. Uh, GP3 was a fencer, yeah? A very good fencer at uh, George Mason University. What, 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 am I not doing it right? There it is, okay. Yeah, GP3 is right here. No mustache, gallant. <laughs> Gallant, uh, streamlined fellow, I'm sure was very, very good. Now, who is this? This is Andy Tausig, right? Look at that face. He's determined. <laughs> He's determined beyond measure to get that over that hurdle. These are high hurdles, you know. These are not just low hurdles, you know. I don't know where Andy is. I think he came in to say hello and left, but you know he's not here because he's not talking, right? 
right? That's exactly right. He would, he would take over my microphone if it were here. I mean that in the most affectionate way, you can be sure. Uh, this is Kevin Akala playing uh, freshman ball at, the, at uh, Southern uh, Illinois University. Uh, he had to make a decision to go to medical school or play football. He wisely uh, quit and went to medical school. Uh, this is uh, to Thomas uh, Martin, otherwise known as Tommy to me and some others. He went to Texas A&M University. Now, technically, he was not a college athlete, but he's my best friend. So, so uh, really, he really, he's a lovely man. So that's why he made it to this cut. Okay, and and uh, and he got he got it by training athletes. These are some of the dogs that he trained when he was in college. What did they do, Tommy? National champions. Are they Labradors? Is that what they are? And this is a, uh, a dinosaur that he went back uh, to 5,000 years ago to get and bring back to this, uh, to this time period. Uh, this is Clay Burnett. Clay really is the real thing, huh? He was star quarterback and wide receiver for East Carolina University. This is actually a picture uh, uh, during a game. Uh, is that you over here, uh, Clay? <laughs> I'm serious. Is that you? Because this is a, they're on defense. You were 86 or 88? 86. I don't see you here, but I tried finding you. Who are the, you know these guys, don't you? Of course you do, right? Yeah. So, uh, so he, he, was, uh, he was pretty, if he didn't go to medical school, I suspect it would have been, uh, would have been NFL. Fortunately for him, his brains uh, maintained themselves and he went to medical school. Uh, uh, Jonesy isn't here, I don't think. He's a great anesthesiologist here. This guy is also the real thing. He's a Iron Man. Uh, he just recently did the Iron Man in Copenhagen. Uh, and he qualified for the world championships. Here he is right here. I didn't put this together. This is on the internet. Right? So uh, those of you who know Jones, you know how serious uh, a scholar and a, um, an athlete he is. Uh, so here are some as a potpourri of others. Uh, our own Amy Clampett Holsenbeck. Many of you know her as a spirited uh, young lady, all-American soccer at Florida Southern College. Uh, Frank Rosemeyer. Uh, basketball in Germany, uh, our own Di Diane White, cross country basketball, track and field, and here she, you're seeing her doing a triathlon here in her younger days. Uh, Ravi uh, Bassesser, uh, soccer at University of Florida, and our new uh, congenital heart surgeon, Frank Pagula, a uh, lacrosse player at uh, Hofstra University, which is no small matter. Hofstra is known very well for its stellar, um, uh, stellar uh, teams in lacrosse. Uh, maybe some of you don't recognize uh, this picture. This is uh, yours truly. I was a fencer in college, captain of the fencing team. Was invited to the uh, World Invitational Tournament uh, when the United States team. Uh, these were great moments. Uh, went to medical school, uh, played rugby, and then uh, afterwards found my true love, which is doing triathlons, and better still doing triathlons with our guest speaker. So who is our guest speaker today? Uh, he's one Constantine David Mavrudis. He's going to talk to us about the road to improve training in congenital heart surgery. He's a PGY6 resident, at, uh, a cardiothoracic resident at the University of Pennsylvania. His ties to Florida Hospital are significant. He actually did the experiment with me here at uh, the Nicholson Center. Uh, and he'll talk about, that's what, uh, one of the things he's going to talk about, which turned out to be a central contribution in the training of congenital heart surgeon. Of course, his other ties to Florida Hospital are genetics. Uh, but not nepotism. He earned his way here, and I'm sure that you'll agree when you hear him uh, speak. Uh, he uh, is a graduate of Williams College and majored in philosophy, which gives him the background that he writes about in bioethics, varsity squash and cycling at that time. He did his first Ironman at that, during that time. Loyola University, multiple marathons, with the second uh, Ironman competition. He was admitted to the I-6 program at the University of Pennsylvania, he had the two-year research uh, pro uh, commitment that he just finished, and to say nothing of the multiple research prizes, which included the Seawalt and Lily High Young Investigators Award, the Outstanding Investigator Award for uh, Cardiology, and the Young Investigator Award for American Heart Association. I'm just, he tells me he's getting another one, and I just didn't have enough room to write it down. Uh, his research project at Florida was simulation cardiac surgery training. Uh, he's done multiple marathons. Uh, he did a, an Ironman in Pl Lake Placid that allowed him to go to, to the World Championships in Kona, uh, and he achieved uh, 
All-American all status in triathlete in 2016 and also All-World uh, Ironman athlete in 2016. He's written 30 peer-reviewed articles, 12 book chapters, and he's heading towards a career in congenital heart surgery. Here he is levitating after 10 hours uh, uh, during the Kona World Championships. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where he found the energy to, I think he's about four feet off the ground here. And um, I wish uh, we were there to see it, but we certainly got the phone call immediately thereafter. So it was a great pleasure and great honor for me to, uh, to introduce Constantine Ravutis, who's going to take us through a, um, a nice uh, review of what uh, congenital heart surgery training is all about. So, Const. <laughs> While we're figuring this out, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to present here. Uh, certainly, like to thank Florida Hospital. Like to thank that probably the most glowing introduction that anyone's ever given to me, and that and that includes barroom conversations. Um, and uh, just really look forward to sharing this with you. Florida Hospital has been instrumental in uh, allowing for this type of research to progress, and I certainly hope that in the future, Florida Hospital will remain um, sort of the stalwarts on the um, road to improve training in congenital heart surgery, as we just got on the board. Great. Um, so I'd like to just start with a personal note. Um, this is, believe it or not, this is Dr. Ebert in the flesh. Uh, there are, you know, there are two sides to the coin of being a sound mind, a sound body, outstanding athlete who's an incredibly competitive person as well. Um, and so on this, you know, Christmas time day, uh, the man wouldn't even let a six-year-old version of me beat him in air hockey. Uh, so, you know, just to give you an idea as to, first of all, how tall he was. Um, so, I mean, I think he had a bit of a height advantage, um, but you know, also just how, you know, what made that man tick, and he was a truly remarkable man, and I'm honored to stand uh, before you today to continue the, this legacy that he's imparted to all of us. Uh, the disclosures that I have, I have a vested interest in this, clearly. I'm not yet finished with my training. I've had a lot of insight into the whole process that I look forward to sharing with you, uh, but, you know, I certainly have vested interest in uh, making sure that we can do this right. Um, I, you know, the, did a lot of this research um, on, with a grant that was sponsored by Florida Hospital. We certainly appreciate that. And it was uh, co-sponsored co by, at least from a research perspective, from the Adnetus Corporation as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few of these things today. We're going to try to get through as many things as we can. I'm probably going to gloss over a little bit of the history so that I don't lose you guys before I get to the, to the good stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the history and the current state of training. We're going to talk about the problems associated therewith. Uh, talk about, you know, in an ideal world, what kind of training would congenital heart surgeons have? how we get there, and then talk a little bit about the research that we did here at Florida Hospital about various aspects of simulation training and the future directions that we might take um, as training the future of uh, congenital heart surgery. So just uh, for all of you who don't know, probably most of you do know, uh, heart surgery and congenital heart surgery in particular is one of the newest surgical subspecialties. Before the 1950s, it was considered universally fatal and pretty much against the law to cut into someone's chest because you were going to kill them. Uh, until the, you know, the advent of cross-circulation and cardiopulmonary bypass by, you know, Gibbon and others and also Lillehei and others uh, in the 50s, which incidentally enough, the first cases were performed on children for congenital heart disease, uh, which su subsequently became an entire specialty in, uh, unto itself. Uh, but before that, you really couldn't do heart surgery. So we're talking about only about 70 years or so of, con of heart surgery and also congenital heart surgery. So there's been a lot developed since those days, uh, where we, we went from something that was universally fatal to something that now has outstanding uh, outcomes, uh, both short and long term. But, you know, just thinking about the things that we kind of take for granted, neonatal heart surgery, you know, operating on babies. This is something that we do every single day here, and this is something that was anathema until the 70s, which was effectively pioneered by Dr. Ebert and others at, at the University of uh, California and also at Harvard and uh, various other institutions. 
And something as sort of, not mundane, but certainly as, com uh, as commonplace as an arterial switch operation was really out, out of favor and very, had a very high mortality until really the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so these are very, very new things. So the operations themselves are new. So training people to do these operations, by extension, is a very, very new thing. We've been training people to be surgeons for hundreds of years, but we have not been training people to be congenital heart surgeons in the modern age with new operations that have a vastly improving mortality seemingly every single year. We have not been doing this for very long. Uh, and so these early experiences with high mortality, it was just a matter of getting these kids to survive. But now it's a matter of uh, standardizing outcomes, improving outcomes, and, and making sure that we're doing the best things that we can for our patients. And so the early days were really just about training surgeons to meet this new demand. You had a patient population who people just let die for, you know, effectively all of human civilization, and now, and now they're surviving. And really, it was a matter that very, very few centers could do it, but now we have many more centers who can do it. So when we're talking about training for surgeons, taking one step back, I think most of the people in this audience know that the, tr the traditional pathway is to do sort of abdominal, general surgery, thoracic surgery, and then congenital heart surgery. Uh, so what this breaks down to is five years of, uh, of, of training in the methods of general surgery, uh, two to three years to do cardiothoracic surgery, and then just one year uh, to learn effectively all of congenital heart surgery. That's sort of the training paradigm that's been adopted in the last 10 years. Uh, but it does bear repeating that the ACGME really only recognized congenital heart surgery as a standardized, legitimate enterprise uh, for, uh, for training in 2007. So this means that every single congenital heart surgeon in this room, um, both of them, um, were trained you know, before uh, organized fellowships. So it was just a matter of finding a place where you could learn a skill set that people thought would then translate into being a congenital heart surgeon. Um, so we're, we're not going to talk too much about this, uh, but suffice it to say, in the earlier days of training, before there were uh, established training routes and established uh, fellowships, there were many ways to become a congenital heart surgeon. And there was a rapidly expanding need for, uh, to, to have these patients get operations. And so as a result, uh, we tried to train as many as we could on our own. We imported people from, uh, from Europe, from Australia, from uh, Japan. And we also sent some of our own to other countries to sort of learn this, this rapidly developing uh, set of skills so that we could do the best thing for our patients. Um, and so, you know, this sort of homegrown model, which is uh, sort of familiar at this time, you know, residents are identified um, and then sort of goes from there. But the issue has always been, and we're not going to talk too much about this because it's certainly not something that I like to think about, um, but, you know, what do you do when, when you have someone who doesn't do well? Uh, and who's already invested, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years of training, uh, the metrics are often difficult because you really don't know how a candidate or a fellow is going to do until they start operating. Uh, so the failure options, you know, you, you know, you can always switch to another congenital program or switch to another subspecialty, but uh, certainly something to keep in mind as we're talking about the the current pathways and how and how people progress. Uh, so. Just to hammer this home one more time, uh, in the early days, there really were these kinds of fiefdoms for training. And uh, it was a matter of getting there, learning all the things that you could, and then sort of going out and proselytizing to the rest of the country to, or to, to establish a program and to, and to do well by the, by the patients. And the, you know, the earlier days with uh, Dr. Blaylock at, at, at Hopkins, Dr. Ebert at, at UCSF, Albert Castaneda in Boston, and Ed Beauvais in, in Michigan, these were sort of the, the first generation of um, organized training programs that existed in the country and then sort of went on from there. Foreign grown, I mean, there's always been a, a history of cross-pollination, both from our, um, the United States sending fellows to other countries to get um, uh, incre increased caseload and also um, going back the other way, where that is, um, sort of the Quintessential institutions for this were the Great Ormond Street and also uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. Um, the also the the other sort of success story for you know, how how we've had fellows over the last 50 years or so has been um, having having trained foreign nationals come to the United States to establish their own programs um, because you know, research was ripe and et cetera et cetera. Um, so you know people like Ian Aberdeen, uh, Dr. Lacour Gaillet, uh, Nirati, Roger Mee. Jan Quagabor, these are sort of the older guard, uh, most of whom I believe are, are retired at this point, but certainly um, instrumental to the development of not only congenital heart surgical methods, but also research and training. Um, there, you know, 
the political situation in this country is not entirely favorable for this at the moment, um, but you know, it certainly was, it, it's never really been easy for this, and, you, and they've uh, almost always had to have political intervention necessary to uh, facilitate this. So now we're just going to talk about what, what we're looking at currently in terms of training. There are 11 uh, uh, nationally recognized ACGME accredited programs. They're all, uh, at, at the moment, they're all one year. Some are transitioning to two years. Uh, so, you know, what does it actually mean to have this fellowship model? You know, it's, a, it's one year where one uh, learns the congenital heart surgical tr um, methods and also un an, an understanding of congenital heart disease. Um, and, it, you know, it, it doesn't really afford a fellow too much time to find a position. Uh, you leave after one year. There's someone who's directly behind you sort of kicking you out the door. And, you know, if you don't have a job by then, you're you're in a not ideal position. Uh, and certainly in a job market that does not have many people, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, uh, that, can be, that can be a setup for failure. So what did we do? Um, and, and by we, I mean people who are a lot smarter than I am, who were part of the, um, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, who uh, figured out sort of what we need as a country. Because this is a, it's something that a lot of people are interested in, something that not a lot of people do. But at the same time, the demand is, uh, needs to be uh, pretty tightly controlled because there, you don't really need a whole lot of congenital heart surgeons. So it was, it was deemed that we needed about 8 to 12 new congenital heart surgeons per year to, to, to fill what will likely be an impending manpower shortage, which is an odd thing to think about because most times it, we don't think about this. Uh, you don't think about how the country might have a shortage of a certain type of physicians because you just assume that medical students, trainees are going to fill in because there's, a, there's sort of like an even split or, or at least a split that kind of makes sense for people to go into various subspecialties. But in congenital heart surgery, the, the, this problem or this perceived problem is actually quite real. Uh, and this manpower study was performed and it, and it showed that uh, you know, not unlike the congenital heart surgeons in this room, you know, they're, they're not in their 40s anymore. Um, and the, the workforce is getting a little bit older and we may have this sort of uh, impending crisis of, of manpower. So that's why this was done. That's why the ACGME established a fellowship to sort of guarantee a pipeline for, for, for new um, congenital heart surgeons. So um, from this, there was training guidelines established, training programs were established, um, and now we're kind of in that critical period where we're trying to train congenital heart surgeons, do it in the right way, so that there's no impending shortage of either manpower or uh, technical and clinical expertise. So in the backdrop of all this, there are a lot of pediatric congenital heart surgery centers um, in this country. Um, Please don't read this. It's not very high resolution. You're going to go blind. But the long and short of it is that there are a lot of these programs. Um, we've never actually done a study like this in the United States to assess how many, sur uh, how many surgeons, how many programs we actually need. Uh, but they did do this in Europe. And in Europe, they, did, they determined that the, the, in an ideal world, a, a congenital heart surgeon would have greater than 250 patients per year. They would have greater than 100 cases of neonatal surgery per year. Uh, they would have complex corrections performed by experienced surgeons. All of these things sort of make sense. The more you do something, the better you are at it, the better the patients do. Um, also, things like heart and lung transplantation, which is more, uh, definitely more common in the adult world, but certainly not very common in the pediatric world. Uh, one would like to have a center that has a adequate experience performing those procedures, which are, of course, very high risk um, at an institution. So the, uh, they deemed all of this, you know, that... Um, you would have to have, well, at this next one, right. So if you had, in, in order to have greater than 250 patients per year, that would, you know, cover about a population of four to six million people. So this, this is when it gets weird, because now you're thinking about an area that has five million people needing only two congenital heart surgeons. I mean, that metropolitan area, at least in this country, does not exist. Uh, I mean, I live in Philadelphia. We have about 1.7 million people, and we have anywhere between four and six congenital heart surgeons. Uh, so, you know, Despite the fact that there is a quote-unquote impending manpower shortage, the other side of that coin is how many of these surgeons do we actually need? And so th no one has a really good answer to that, and that's not really the purpose of this talk. It's more, more just to say that we have a lot of data on you know, what we think we need. We have a lot of data on what we think needs to be trained, at least for the future generation, but we haven't really figured out a way to resolve um, the, the seemingly conflicting nature of those data. Um, so the, the, the long and short of it is that you know, 100, in this country, by those, by just running the numbers, they say that we only need 120 congenital heart surgeons, but we have almost double that in this country. So 
I don't really know what to do with those data. Um, I don't think anyone really knows what to do with those data, but it's just something to keep in mind as we're talking about, you know, what do we really need to do? Do we need to train more surgeons? Do we need to train better surgeons? Do we need to train people for longer? Or do we need to train people for a more efficient period of time? So as I alluded to earlier, the current training program is a one-year program. Some, some, are, some are moving to two as a result of the uh, need for improved clinical um, sort of expertise. And there, there, is, a, there is a curriculum. Um, it includes difficult operations. You're supposed to you know, perform them on kind of a graded scale. Even things like Norwoods and, our, and arterial swishes are, are included in that um, because they sort of have to be. Um, and there is a, um, the idea was that in order to get 10 candidates per year to enter the workforce, we'd have to train 12 to 14 fellows uh, in the year. And again, this is all based on the manpower study that was done about 10 years ago. So that's kind of where we're at currently. And everything beyond that, is, is neither codified nor standardized, and you can have widely discrepant quality and quantity of, of a training period among what is really a pretty small cohort of fellows. So these are the rules, and that's it. So as a result, there, there are some problems associated with that, as you can imagine. Um, we're talking about people who have operated in the abdomen on adults primarily for seven years, who then go to operate on adults in the thorax for two to three years. And then in one year, they're supposed to learn everything involving pediatric physiology, pediatric cardiovascular physiology, the technical aspects of congenital heart surgery, and all of this other stuff. I could probably spend an entire hour just talking about that. And we're supposed to do that in 365 days. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of you know, problems with that. But the idea is that if we're going to do this, if we're going to continue this, because you can't just make it a 10-year training program, because then obviously no one will do it. So the question is, how can we do this in a more efficient manner that's, that, that's the safest for patients? So, and in the backdrop here, you know, we don't, we don't usually talk about it like this, and maybe we should never say these sorts of things, but we're kind of a victim of our own success. Uh, adult cardiac surgery, pediatric cardiac surgery. You know, these, these kids, these patients, these adults, they all died 50 years ago, and now, mortality for these operations is so low that they expect nothing but the best. They expect nothing but to not only do well in the short term, but to get out of the hospital with normal, healthy lives. And that is fantastic. I mean, it is, I mean it's, a, it's nothing short of a miracle that in about 50, 60 years we've, we've progressed to this point. However, uh, the problem with that is that any deviation from these, especially in the era of public reporting, um, you know, survival is really not even enough. These patients want to leave the hospital. They want to just do very, very well, and they absolutely should expect that. Uh, but it certainly becomes uh, paradoxical in terms of, you know, surgical volume and training because you need surgical volume to train somebody, but in order to train, but in order for that person to succeed, they need to be safe. Uh, safety comes with volume, but volume doesn't necessarily come with safety. It's certainly at the at the beginning of it. You know, your first couple cases they're not going to go well. Uh, you need to have institutional support. You need to have the ability to. You know, deal with the fact that not everyone's going to do well um, before you have that critical 10,000 hours, as, as Malcolm Gladwell puts it. Um, and, you know, what do we do with that in the era of public reporting when patients are quite rightly demanding only the best? Uh, I can attest from my own personal experience that there are many patients who seek out our institution uh, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They seek out a particular surgeon, and they absolutely unequivocally demand that fellows not even be in the same room as the operation. That can be very problematic when you're at an, an ostensibly a training institution and it's unfortunately a, a not uncommon uh, situation to have. Um, the, other, the other problems with this is that you know, every year we can't mandate that 10 people retire from the field. We can't mandate that 10 people sort of find some other work to do. Uh, so there is an inconsistent manpower uh, demand year to year and as a result you have people who are PGY seemingly 5,000 but really just sort of 10 years of training. Uh, who don't have a job, uh, don't have a place to go. So what can we really do about this? So we can start, about, we can start by talking about the things that uh, we can't change. We can't really change the fact that public reporting is here. It's here to stay. There are problems with it. The best we can do is work with the public reporting institutions to make sure that people really understand that the mortality at a high-risk institution should be compared 
or it, it, it's, it's problematic to compare with the mortality of a lower risk institution. This is something that seems very easy to do, but is incredibly difficult, and the nuances of, of statistics and the nuances of you know, facts versus fake news, of course, in, in, this, in, in this society is problematic enough. Um, the, and so the public really needs to be able to expect that we're going to do the best thing for them and they're going to get the best outcome. So that, we can't change the public's um, assessment of what we do because that would completely defeat the purpose, nor can we change the fact that we have to tell the public about it. Um, these, the boards that exist, the sort of traditional pathway of you know, abdominal surgery, thoracic surgery, congenital heart surgery are also probably not going anywhere. They're you know, from the mid-19th uh, century and you know, things tend to move at a rather glacial rate with those. So we're probably not going to change the quantity of time necessary to train. We're probably not going to be able to, uh, to change public reporting, nor are we going to be able to change the fact that we have progressed so well within this field in the last 60 years that, these, that, that everyone's doing well and they demand um, success. We can't change all that. Um, but the things that we, that, that we need to consider are, two, are, are really two in nature. One is that the trainee needs to have superior technical training without putting patients at risk. These are seemingly um, con conflicting statements, but I'm hoping that for the rest of this talk, uh, we're going to talk about ways that, that, that we can actually facilitate that. And probably more importantly, uh, the attendings who are ultimately responsible for the lives of these patients need to feel safe and need to feel like they're able to teach fellows in a way that will not compromise patient care. Um, so you know, how can we do that? And I'm hoping that I can convince you by the end of this, uh, with the you know, 20 minutes or so that we have left, that that uh, simulation is a, way, is a way to do that. So what do we, what do we mean by simulation? We're not talking about um, flight simulators. You know, we're not talking about video games. We're talking about a, a, a concept that is pretty well uh, illustrated by the, the idea of deliberate practice, which is defined as focused, repeating tasks uh, to improve performance with coaching and immediate feedback. There is a, a quote that is in the simulation lab at the University of Michigan where they do um, you know, laparoscopic, thoracoscopic, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass cannulation, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a huge quote up there. It's almost like the, the Notre Dame, like, play like a champion thing today. And it, it, it says, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So it's not enough to just sort of tie knots on your bedpost or to sew chicken breasts together, you know, with nobody watching you in the middle of the night, which is, you know, cool. Uh, but it, it probably isn't going to make you the kind of surgeon that you want to be, and, and it's also probably not going to you know, really simulate what it's like to flow through an operation to potentially deal with consequences, et cetera, et cetera. All of these, uh, the, the current um, simulation techniques that we have, and I don't have time to, to go into what all of those are, uh, they've been reviewed pretty favorably by, by trainees. Uh, they're, you know, they're just sort of starting to come into play in, in the cardiothoracic surgical world with things like coronary anastomosis models. Um, but they're certainly in, in their infancy. Um, so when we're talking about the ideal model for, for uh, surgical simulation, um, it should be, you know, at, at least in theory, inexpensive, easy to set up, high fidelity, reproducible, and simulate the intraoperative challenges that are specific to the field. And by that, I mean specific to the operative field. You know, um, cardiac and thoracic surgery are, are difficult for a lot of reasons, but one of them is your target is pretty far away from your hands. You have to kind of reach in the chest. Uh, the angles associated with that can be, can be a challenge. And of course, it needs to be effective. And we're going to talk about ways that we can potentially measure success. So um, this is sort of science fiction into science fact. We're at the point right now where we can 3D print um, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, and one of those things is models of a heart. Um, Dr. Yu and Dr. Van Arsdell um, at the at SickKids Hospital in Toronto um, have found ways to take MRA and CTA specimens of actual you know, patients uh, with actual congenital heart uh, pathology and turn them into 3D models that are sort of silicon-based um, models for the purposes of you know, reviewing complicated anatomy in patients where you know, even, e even in congenital heart surgery, even in uh, you know, an era of 50 different ways of, of looking at the heart, sometimes you really have no idea what the heart looks like uh, until you get into the chest. And sometimes you don't have the luxury of sort of figuring it out as you go along. So these have actually helped. Uh, well, depending on the surgeon you ask, they've either helped or they've just made your life a little bit more complicated um, or just have not been helpful at all. Certainly the surgeons at CHOP have not really fully embraced this yet, but uh, we'll see. 
in any case, uh, these have been debuted uh, both at the, ho at the Hospital for Sick Kids in general, um, but also at the AATS meeting and various other meetings, and have been uh, pretty well received. Um, you can see here that uh, you know, this, is a, this is a model of transposition of the great arteries. This is a status post repair, uh, whatever you want to call it, sort of in a um, ex, ex situ, ex vivo uh, 3D printed specimen. Lecompton anastomosis that you see here, um, you know, you can suture this material, you can retract this material, you can sort of put it however you want. And this is a hypoplastic left heart variant uh, you know, from an actual patient uh, where, you know, the Norwood patch has been completed, the, the damus anastomosis, uh, over sewing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, these models, uh, they, are, they are here to stay. Uh, this program exists, uh, they're doing, I believe, twice a year now for, um, for you know, residents, fellows, and even younger attendings who want uh, practice doing these operations. Uh, and the, certainly the, the biggest pro for this kind of thing is that it is, it is anatomically correct. You know, they, this is the actual pathology. This is actually what you're going to see. Uh, the problem with this is that it is expensive to do. Uh, the methods for surgical, uh, for uh, 3D printed, uh, 3D printing, uh, the materials, the, the actual 3D printers themselves are quite expensive, at least for the moment. Uh, so the same thing with any technology, it'll probably get cheaper. Uh, these, they don't have valves, which you can imagine. I mean, this is, this is silicon based. Uh, the, the material has to be thick to hold its rigidity and to hold its structure. Uh, so you can't have material that is you know, is effectively translucent, it's so thin, and that's all of valve tissue. So valve work you can't do, uh, and you can't, at least they haven't really done this yet, they haven't really put it into a chest with the spatial concerns. So, you know, the, as you'll see uh, right here, um, and these are, you know, a lot of very famous congenital heart surgeons, and then some random imposter with a bow tie, I'll let you figure out who that is. Um, you know, you have Dr. Earl Austin, you have Dr. Glenn Van Arsdell, and you have Dr. Tom Spray, who, um, and as you can see, you know, I am sitting down, right? I am, you know, my hands are in the air. We're not, you know, deep in a chest, and you could effectively, you know, walk all the way around this thing and operate on it, you know, basically standing on your head if you wanted to. Um, so, you know, you have to sort of, you know, make it as lifelike as you can, but because you can take those shortcuts, because you can't, necessarily master the needle angles, master the angles of approach, uh, the, they're somewhat limited at the moment. So the other, the other idea is to use animals. Um, there are many success stories for, for animal uh, training or animal, animal research training um, in, in other surgical specialties. Most people who are familiar with uh, robot simulation, at least uh, I believe the Da Vinci um, company or that organization uh, tends to use pigs uh, to, train, to train their surgeons. Um, there, there were models in the, in the pediatric uh, cardiothoracic surgical world where uh, they used um, rabbits, of all things, uh, for boctal like hernia repair. They created a, a repair. They used thoracoscopic methods to train uh, residents, fellows, trainees uh, to, to repair these from, a, from thoracoscopic uh, methods. And the other thing that people don't really talk about is what does it actually mean to spend two years in the lab and to do animal research? I did it. I think probably many, many people in this room did that um, with their, uh, in, in fact, Dr. Burnett was uh, telling us about some hilarious stories that he has about his various travails with rhesus monkeys um, in the lab. You know, but these, these are not necessarily typical experiences. It's not a required aspect of it. And it's hard to really quantify what these research experiences mean. I operated on a lot of pigs um, during my two years of fellow or two, two years of research training. I think that made me a better surgeon. It's very hard to quantify that. I know that a lot of other surgeons feel the same way. Uh, but there's no organized um, uh, and sort of mandated uh, animal-based research aspect for any, for any uh, uh, surgical fellowship. So it's hard to know you know, who, who benefited from that and, and to what extent. Um, and, and so as a result, there are no animal models. This is a, this is a field that, you know, really has, it, it's an unmet need in my opinion, uh, and I'm hoping that I can convince you by the end of this that it is an unmet need and that we can fix this. So what did we do? Uh, this is, this was a, a rather odd familial bonding time that, that my father and I did. Uh, we did this in two and a half days. We had five piglets, uh, which were, uh, which was kind of a joint venture with the Nicholson Center here at Florida Hospital. Um, and it, we simulated a bunch of procedures. And a, and a lot of these were sort of index cases that any 
uh, recent trainee really should be should, should be familiar with. And uh, things like as, as technically complicated as, as a Norwood, an arterial switch, a Ross. Um, just for the purposes of, of this talk, we're not going to talk about exactly what those things are. Uh, you know, we have we all have Google, but at the same time, you know, the the long and short of it is that this covers the gamut of not all of congenital heart surgery, but certainly going from the less technically demanding to the, to the more technically demanding aspects of the field. Um, so without going into you know, reading the entire corpus of congenital heart surgery, um, you can understand that we did these so that we can show that even something as relatively uh, uh, simple, I suppose, as an ASD repair can be done, and something as relatively complicated as an arterial switch or an oral procedure can also be done. Um, this was a a senior surgeon uh, me mentoring, you know, a very junior uh, trainee. And we also had um, Diane White. We had uh, Amy Clampett Hansenfeld, um, who were also with us. Uh, so there were, there were four of us. We had, if it, we had it, we're in an operating room. And so the, the goal of this was to simulate in as high fidelity manner as possible um, what it was like to go through these operations. And we did... Um, so I'm just going to talk to you now about sort of the, the very specific technical concerns about a few of these operations, uh, because it's very easy to imagine how we can create a hole in, in a heart, fix the hole in the heart, call it a day, declare victory. But some of these uh, can be very difficult to, to model just because we don't have the, the pathology. So um, what we did here, and this is a Norwood procedure, which is you know, characterized by an aorta pulmonary uh, amalgamation, uh, oversewing the pulmonary artery, aortic arch augmentation, and the creation of a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt. Now, those are a lot of fancy words uh, that, are, that are depicted in pictures here, but the thing that I want you guys to understand, just, just for the purposes of, uh, of the didactic utility for, for these models, and I promise I won't belabor this point too much, but this part of the procedure probably has one of the most profound impacts, I would argue, in the neurological outcome of a baby. So this is a very difficult part to teach. Uh, you don't have the luxury of time necessarily if you're under what's called deep hypothermic circulatory arrest or if you're um, selectively perfusing the brain. This is a very, you know, the clock is in this case literally ticking when an attending seemingly miraculously and through some wizardry fixes a patch in such a way where it beautifully recreates what a native aorta should look like. I've had so many people say, how in God's name does Tom Spray do this in, you know, how, in, in however short a period of time that he does it? Because it, it's very difficult to assess. I mean, he, he, he makes a few cuts, and then it's done. Because he, he, doesn't have the, he doesn't have the luxury of time to safely walk you through every single stitch that he's placing and every single cut of the scissors that he's making. So this is, I want you to just realize that this is a very high risk part of this operation. It is something that is incredibly difficult to teach, I would imagine. Never had the, the, uh, the pleasure or I guess the burden of having to do that. So what we did in this situation was this model as a, as a, in, in a sort of freshly sacrificed pig, we, we, we had the luxury of time. And it was a perfect simulation of what deep hypothermic circulatory rest is because nothing is moving. Uh, in this case, the animal is, is dead, but we were able to you know, put cannulas in to just show what, it, what the spatial concerns are like. And then, you know, I had the, the, the luxury of learning what it means to create this patch, what it, you know, why it's important to cut it in a certain way, why it's important to sew it in a certain way, and what the specific technical uh, considerations are. Now, this is something that you really just can't do in a child if you care about a good outcome or if you care about a kid, you know, not having a stroke, which, of course, we all do, so that's an absurd point. Um, the, other th the other procedure, uh, the sort of high-risk procedure that we did was the arterial switch. Now, again, you know, the arterial switch uh, has a lot of specific technical considerations uh, associated with it, and this is not a reflection of the pathology because this animal did not have a transposition of the great arteries. However, things like coronary translocation, Lecomte maneuver, all those things can be performed, and these are high-risk maneuvers as well. Um, you know, if you, if you mess up the coronary translocation in, in a child, there's a very, very low um, margin for error. And, you know, these kids can, um, I mean, th these kids can die from that. Uh, so 
but again, this is, this is an aspect of the operation with a very specific uh, time consideration. You, know, you don't want this, this operation to take longer than it has to, and therefore it can be very, very difficult to train someone to do. So we had the luxury of time. We were able to simulate this, and these are beautiful drawings from uh, Rashid Idris, um, who's uh, an artist who we, who we commissioned to do this. Uh, and you know, just to show you that you know, this operation can be performed, I mean, it's, it's the, the wrong operation for this patient's pathology or complete lack thereof, but the important technical considerations can be performed. So what else did we do? <coughs> uh, we we uh, recorded all of these with mounted and, and fixed cameras. Um, we, we timed all the maneuvers that we did, uh, and we tested all the anastomoses by saline injection. So you know, the limitations of the model are obviously that the animal's dead. You don't really have the, you don't come off bypass, you don't um, you know, see if there's bleeding, but we, you know, we tried to simulate all all of those considerations to the best that we could. The beauty of this is that you know, it's neonatal tissue. Neonatal tissue is, is very, very difficult to work with, has, has specific uh, concerns. You, know, you, can't, you can't tug on that right atrium, it'll fall right off. You, know, you, can't, uh, you can't mess around too much with the aorta, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can do all of these repairs um, in situ with the anatomic challenges that exist, so things like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which if you bag it has specific consequences. Uh, spinal arteries, if they bleed, it's a huge problem, particularly with distal aortic work, uh, or distal a aortic work. Valves, um, cannula, all those things can be you know, kind of in your way, and, and, and these are very important things to keep in mind when you're doing these operations. Uh, and you can also perform multiple operations on a single piglet. They're not on bypass, they're not, we're not worried about bringing them back. Uh, you can just sort of say, okay, that was cool, let's do something else. Um, additional personnel, also not necessary. All these things do is increase cost. Um, you know, the, the disadvantages are that you know, this is non-anatomic. The pictures that I showed you um, would not pass for any uh, uh, medical textbook of what these things actually look like uh, because, you know, these are, these are obviously in pigs and they're in pigs who have normal anatomy and we're just sort of simulating um, the methods on them. So, um, what do we want to do with this? Uh, why did we do this? Uh, was this just a like, fun thing to do at, at the Nicholson Center? Well, yes. Um, but what else do we want to do with it? We think that this could be a very important uh, first step toward developing more simulation models in the field of congenital heart surgery. Um, we envision that this might be something that could be centralized in a, in a boot camp setting, uh, which also exists to us, which currently exists to a, to a lesser extent in the adult cardiac surgical world, um, to have fellows come for a few days to learn these techniques and maybe even bring them back for a, uh, just to sort of test their knowledge, see how well they did. Um, or, or, I mean, you know, we don't have any ownership of this. People can do this on their own in, in institutions if they're able to, to figure out the logistics associated therewith. Um, and the, uh, the, the other future directions, and you know, these are things that are not mutually exclusive, you know, uh, these inorganic simulation methods, the 3D printing, you know, the, the, the other things like that, they will also continue to get better. So I think that the debate for the future is not if we will have simulation in uh, you know, most surgical specialties, congenital heart surgery being one of them, but you know, how we're going to do it the best possible way that we have to, to deploy this. Uh, so I just want to wrap up here. So the, um, these challenges are not going to go away. Parents rightly are going to demand that their child has the best possible care. Um, and these things might actually get worse, depending on how we manage the issue of public reporting um, and, and things of that nature. Trainees and, and attending surgeons need to be protected. Uh, you know, in this era, we can't afford to have institutions penalized for doing the right thing. And the right thing is operating on sick people and training the future generation of surgeons. Because if we have that, then we have completely nullified the, the immense progress that has been made over the last 50 years in this field. Simulation should play a role in this because uh, there is a large gap that exists. It's almost a, it's a seemingly deifying gap to see an attending perform these operations with such facility. Um, and so we're currently just at this crossroads. The first 50 years of cardiac surgery was getting these patients to survive and you know, establishing these training fiefdoms that, that existed for you know, a very long time. If you wanted this type of surgery, you had to go here. Or you had to go there. The next 50 years... I would argue, of congenital heart surgical training, adult heart surgical training, will be defined more by how we can um, standardize our outcomes, improve our outcomes, and just train and, and make it as, as uniform as possible. We don't really want to have 
you know, a, a, a cohort of surgeons that are trained in one way and a cohort of surgeons that are trained in another way. We do need to have room for um, improvement in techniques and uh, innovation, but at the same time, we need to establish for as broad of an audience, as broad of a, of a training population as we can to make sure that everyone is safe and that everyone can have um, the, the, the best, the most efficient training uh, experience possible to fulfill the promise that we've made over the last 60 years to our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. I, th I think we have a couple of minutes uh, for a discussion. Tom, you've, uh, Tom Martin, you've trained uh, residents for over 20 years, I would imagine. Uh, what are your comments? I wouldn't even pretend to uh, lead you into anything. So uh, what are your thoughts about this? So number one, it's an outstanding talk, and I think it's very uh, apropos to the times. Uh, I think simulation um, is a great avenue, f um, and we're headed more and more towards simulation and some type of inorganic simulation. My own personal preference is the simulation in an operating room. Um, I said for years and years, people say we need better results. Why so every 99% um, of the cases I did at the University of Florida were done by a resident. Mm. I put my results up against anybody else's. I was taught to do switches. I was taught to do Norwoods. I was taught to do all those and those. And I was helped as a second-year thoracic resident to do those operations by congenital heart surgeons who were dedicated to training. So number one, it takes dedicated people to training that can fix whatever the resident messes up. So I think training in the future needs people like you that are going to be dedicated to training and commit yourself to that if that's what you want to do. Amen. I think uh, you may think that there are many people like Tom. There aren't. I don't know if he's one of a kind, but he certainly is a few of a kind. Any other comments, any questions for Constantine? Yes. Constantine, thank you for being here today. It's a really privilege to, to hear you. And help pick your dad back up after he falls. So, uh, the um, you know I think that the American Board of Thoracic Surgery is going through an entire transition and obviously has grasped and embraced uh, the simulation um, uh, training process. I, and I'm interested in your because you went run from medical school to I6. Mm -hmm. and we've had a couple of I6 residents here and done fellowships with us for a period of time. Looking back. Um, as general surgery isn't the general surgery that we went through. It's, it's more uh, scopes and abdominal work. Uh, do you think there's any role in general surgery any longer uh, preparing for the American Board of Thoracic Surgery qualifying exams? Do you think there should be a maturation process where everybody maybe does a year or two of medicine or some type of, of, um, of a fellowship to then prepare them for the I-6 program? Because what happened was we didn't have enough young people like yourself wanting to go into this, invest six, eight, ten years. So I'd just be interested in your thoughts looking back with the I-6 program because it comes up at a lot of the meetings we're in. That is a... Much ink has been spilled on this, uh, on this issue, and thank you for, for, for that question. It's, it'll be difficult to address all those points in, in, in anything less than another hour, but uh, the... The, the, the reason why the, the integrated programs, at least as it was sold to me, were, were created uh, was you know, a variety of things. You know, the, the lack of uh, necessarily the general surgery training being apropos for you know, cardiac, the you know, manpower shortages that occurred, the uh, work hour misery that was occurring certainly in the, late 90, in like the mid to late 90s and probably m much before then. Of, tra of trainees just burning out of, uh, of the field and not wanting to progress further because it was just such, su such misery. Um, so with that, you know, the advent of the Integrated Six programs came out. And you know, from my own personal experience, you know, I think it's been much more apropos. I've been uh, exposed to sort of a, a more physiologic rather than anatomic training period. Um, that is to say, you know, I'm learning a lot more about cardiovascular physiology by the specific curriculum that we have at the University of Pennsylvania and also you know, the early exposure to cardiac surgery uh, that we get in the program. You know, it's the fact that I really haven't gone through a general surgery residency, it's very difficult for me to comment as to how apropos it's going to be in the future. But uh, you know, it, certainly from the experience of quote unquote learning how to operate, which is a difficult thing even to assess, you know, what does it actually mean to be you know, facile with a lot of these skill sets. Um, you know, I think that you know, the Integrated Six program, at least for me, was the right thing to do. Um, I imagine that it's something that I would always re recommend to people. But the, the problem is that if you don't have a backup plan, 
and that's going to be problematic for the future. We haven't seen it yet, but um, you know, to you know, to wrap up something that could take another hour to explain. You know, the the lack of a backup plan and what to do with personnel who are trained and can't find a job or decide they don't want to do it is going to be a very very big issue. A last question, Dr. Pagula. Thanks. Uh, that was a spectacular talk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you a hard question now. Perfect. <laughs> and that. You know, I, I was involved with training residents through some of these cases, and it's, it's a difficult um, thing for both, you know, the, the, the uh, trainer and the trainee. But the question is, you've got somebody who's invested seven or eight years and kind of tagging along to your previous comment is, what do you do? How do you handle the situation when you find they can't do it? Because, you know, you're talking about the technical aspects, which is fine, very important integral part of it, but there's a lot more than just the technical aspects of, treating congenital heart disease, and that's always a very, very difficult thing to do. Are there metrics we can use? Is this one of the metrics? Are there certain thresholds you should be able to achieve technically mm. before you're graduated from a program? How do you handle that, and, and uh, what do they do? One In one minute or less. I, a point that, that I wanted to make that's a bit controversial is we have, we being the future of congenital heart surgery, I suppose, we have one year to learn all of these things. There are ways to fail in any number of things. If you don't understand the physiology, you'll fail. If you suck at dealing with people, you fail. If you can't deal with children, you fail. If you can't operate, you fail. So these are, I mean, and there are many other ways to fail in congenital heart surgery. If the purpose of this simulation is clearly not to train congenital heart surgeons as a, on the whole. A, a potential use for this is just to isolate the technical aspects of the procedure and to understand the procedures themselves. I think that if we do this right, we can make this process a little bit more efficient. I'm not so naive as to suggest that in one year we can train perfect cohort of, of surgical trainees. But I do think that a lot of time, you could even argue that a lot of the time might be wasted from a trainee's perspective. And that is to say, does a trainee have any business scrubbing into a very, very challenging case in July? Maybe, maybe not. Could that time be better spent assessing that trainee's potential performance in other aspects of the field? Maybe. If we can train people in a, in a more efficient manner to do the technical things, I think that we'll be, we'll be able to better assess and therefore address potential deficiencies in the other wide-ranging aspects um, uh, and skills that are required to be successful in the field. So the idea is not to train longer. The idea is not to train uh, train harder, clearly, but the idea is to train more efficiently, and therefore we can train the totality, I think. Constantine, it's been an awesome time to have you, and we enjoyed last night's dinner as well, so thank you for taking time out of your training practice to come and share with us. Uh, all these are important things, and, and you delivered such an eloquent and, and nicely put together speech. You can tell whose son you are, and your mother, Martha, did a great job with both of you. <laughs> So, in all seriousness, I don't think there's a more admirable compliment than a son who follows in his father's footsteps, and obviously that's the impact that your father's had on you, and we can all sense that, not only from your relationship, but with our relationship with Gus. So, uh, again, you've joined a long list of very uh, of competent people uh, in the Paul Ebert lectureship, and we'd like to present you with a plaque uh, commemorating uh, today's uh, talk, and again, we wish you nothing but the best in your ongoing training, and we know you're going to do great things. So, uh, Constantine, thank you again for being here, and we'd all like to thank you as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> this completes uh, Grand Rounds today and Paul Ebert Lectureship. Uh, Gus, thank you again. It was awesome. We appreciate it. Have a good day.